everyone. It's great to be with you. We're here to lift the name of Jesus. We'd love for you to join in with us, all right? Let's go. See the tomb where he lay. See the stone.
get a glimpse of heaven here on earth every nation every tribe every tongue singing holy 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 we know that in heaven it'll never stop it'll never cease it'll be day and night night and day that we'll be singing your praises for all eternity so we look forward to that day but until then we'll praise you now we'll give you all the glory and all the honor right now in this moment we sing this to you. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs. As I often do But 
every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again, cause all that I have is a hallelujah, I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah I've got one response I've got just one you get shy or be lift up your song cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs get up and praise the Lord come on come on my soul oh don't you get shy lift up your song cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs get up and praise Hallelujah, 
excited to be able to experience it with you, especially if this is your first time with us today. We're so excited that you're here. We're honored that you have spent a part of your week with us. And so thanks so much for being with us here today. And if this is your first time with us or you've been with us for a long time, we want you to know that we would love to be able to connect with you. And one of the ways you can do that is through our TPO Connect form. You can always find that on our website and it's gonna come through in the chats. And that's just a way for our team to follow up with you, to get to know your name, to get to hear your story and to see how we can encourage you in your walk with Jesus. So we'd love to be able to connect with you. Let us know through that Connect form. Well, like we said in the pre-show today with our lead pastor, Aaron Brockett, we are kicking off a brand new series next week. It's called Recalibrate, and we are gonna walk through the book of Romans. And I'm really excited about this series for a number of reasons, but I just wanna highlight a couple ways that you can get more connected. Even if you're not local to the city of Indianapolis, you can be involved in this as the Traders Point online family. And I'm so excited to take a step deeper together. See, we see this series not just as a sermon series, but as a journey that we wanna go on together. And so we put together a Romans journal, and you can head to our website at tpcc.org slash journal and sign up. We will ship a journal to you if you're not local. If you are local, you can head to a physical campus and pick one up next week, but we will ship one to you if you're not local anywhere in the country. And that's a way for us to go on the journey together 
on a daily basis to be in God's word together, to be walking through uh, the Romans, the book of Romans, and to be working with what Aaron's saying in the sermon series with the daily Bible reading and to be on that journey together. But as you fill out that form on the website, you can select to be followed up with about group. We're gonna create a short-term group, an opportunity for people to connect face-to-face via Zoom, uh, to be able to walk through what God is teaching us through Romans and to be able to connect with other people from Traders Point Online. So let us know. We'd love to help you get connected in that way. Well, our lead pastor, Aaron Brockett, is back from sabbatical today, and he's going to bring the heat. So let's go ahead and prepare our hearts. Let's get ready to hear from God's Word together. Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? Man, good to be with you. Gosh, sit down, sit down. Appreciate that. Hey. If uh, this happens to be your uh, first weekend to be with us, you're like, what in the world is going on? Uh, I'm like, I think you guys should greet us every week like that. I think that would just be amazing. But uh, no, thank you for that. This, this feels so good. I've missed you all. I've missed being here. Uh, it is really, really, really good uh, to be back with all of you. And if you joined us over the summer months, uh, I've been away on an extended three-month sabbatical, which I think is maybe the longest time I've ever kind of taken away uh, since I've been here. And that is a gift that uh, our elders, as well as all of you, I just want to acknowledge that, grant to our pastoral staff for every seven years of uh, ministry. And uh, so that was my second sabbatical that I've had since I've uh, been here. And it is a gift that uh, I don't feel entitled to. I don't, I don't expect it. I don't think that it's something that I ha- um, should have like every seven years. So I'm really, really grateful when it comes And, uh, you know, uh, you might be asking, like, well, you know, what is that all about? And uh, really, uh, this kind of stems from, I think one of the importance of, like, taking some time away came from uh, some reading I was doing when I was in college. And I remember uh, reading that only 20% of leaders in the Bible finished well. Like, just let that, like, wash over you for a minute. Like, out of the, everybody that you read about in the Bible, only 20% of them finished well, meaning that when they hit the tape at the end of their life, calling and ministry, that uh, they, they, they finished uh, with, able to hold their head up high. And that 80% had maybe made some sort of a dumb decision that hurt themselves, the people they love, or the calling of God on their life. I remember as a young man reading that, thinking, how in the world do I finish well? And I think there's a lot of ways to answer that question, but one of them is taking some periodic time away Uh, before you make a dumb decision (laughs) to evaluate your motives, to evaluate your calling, like like it's it's a reminder of who you are in Christ, not just what you do for God. And I think that's so important. And the way I figure is that every single one of us, regardless of whether you're in full-time ministry or not, we will at some point in our lives take some time away from the thing that we do, whatever that is, whether that's voluntarily or involuntarily. And I would much rather step away voluntarily and take, take some time to uh, just remember who I am in Christ. And man, it was just so good just to be able to read the Bible without having to get up a sermon and uh, to be able to worship with my family on the weekends. And uh, we had some great family time. Many of you know that uh, uh, we just sent our oldest uh, off to college a few weeks ago. So big, big transition in our family. Uh, my oldest is uh, uh, my only boy. And so now I'm in a house full of girls. And so please pray. And uh, it is awesome and totally weird. And uh, so, uh, but uh, we just sent uh, our son off. He's a freshman at uh, Purdue. And I I was waiting for you. I was waiting for you. And uh, I know that is a, like a divisive thing to say in our church. I remember uh, when I was interviewing here uh, 14 years ago, I remember like we were talking about like all like serious stuff, you know, doctrine and what's your view of God's word and the Holy Spirit. And are you going to root for Purdue or IU? That was like in the thing, I was like, and I remember at the time, like they think I got that question so much in my first few years here and I didn't know how to answer it because I really didn't have a dog on that fight because I'm like from Southwest Missouri. And so I started to be like, I tried to like try to figure out who you were rooting for. And then I would just be like, go go with that one. Or I tried to do this for a while, both. Like I'm just cheering for both. And that made everybody mad. (laughs) And so now that I've got a a child uh, at Purdue, I can definitively say, boiler up. All right. And uh, I know, I know, I just made about half of you really angry, but what else is new? That's why I had to go on sabbatical. All right. So, (laughs) hey, uh, man, did you guys enjoy the guest speakers this summer? Weren't they amazing? Man, they did a great job. And uh, 
I actually thought you enjoyed him a little too much, really. And uh, I was wondering if uh, I was going to have a job when I came back. Uh, but I, I really kind of put that series together because I thought, like, who do I really want to listen to over the summer? And so just reached out uh, to them. I and mean, they did an amazing job. And not only that, I want to give props to you guys. You guys are so encouraging, loving, and uh, kind. I mean, every single guest speaker texted me on Sunday afternoon and said, your people are amazing. And so I just want to thank you guys for loving on them so well. And uh, I also uh, just want to uh, give a giant thank you to our team as I was away. Our team has done an amazing job. Do you appreciate them and everything that they do around here? And uh, 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 I, uh, I don't know what this says about me as a leader, that things actually go better when I'm not around. I don't know how to interpret that. All right. So anyway, uh, hey, uh, if you've got a Bible or a, a Bible with a device or a, a device with a Bible on it, go ahead and find John chapter four. I'm a little rusty, right, as you can already tell. And uh, somebody said, hey, are you nervous? And uh, I was like, yeah, I'm really nervous. And they're like, I mean, don't worry about it. It's like riding a bike. I was like, yeah, but the last time I took a break from riding a bike and I got back on, I wrecked. So... Uh, we'll see how this goes. So John chapter uh, four, I want to put a cap on uh, the summer series that we've been in today with this standalone message. I've just entitled Dry Fountains. You'll know what I'm talking about here in just a minute. And then I also want to set up our fall teaching series that we're going to jump into next weekend. So you want to make sure that uh, you come, you, you, you with, are tuned in with us as we jump into this series because really excited about uh, the content that we're going to cover this fall. But um, uh, John chapter 4, and as you're finding that, I just really want to ask you this question, and I, I want you to, to, to sit in this for just a minute. Um, what is it like to feel thirsty? Now, I know like we could answer that in a number of ways. I want you just to take a minute to think about what that feels like. And for me, it's always like being transported in my past somewhere to a time in which I was really thirsty. Maybe that for you, that was when you came in from recess on a hot day in grade school and you stood in line at the water fountain. Remember those? Remember when we could actually use those? <laughs> um, maybe uh, it was the summer when you were out west and you're on a hiking trip in the hot sun and maybe your uh, camelback pack burst a leak. You ran out of water and your thirst just increased with each depleting step that you took. I remember the first time I traveled overseas, uh, the country that I went to, I don't know if this is true now, but it was true then, they, they just didn't serve cold drinks. Like you'd go up to the little vendor and they would maybe only have two or three uh, drinks that were actually cold. And the way it was told to me then was uh, just like how you and I won't go outside now in the wintertime without a coat or a jacket. Why? Because we might catch a cold. They said, well, if we drink something cold, we might catch a cold. At least that was true in those countries then. I don't know about now. And so I learned very, very quickly uh, to be at the front of the line because they would run out of cold drinks after just two or three people. And I hated being thirsty. I don't like being thirsty. I, uh, I, I kind of Googled the effects of uh, thirst this last week and I saw that it's just like this like dry mouth, like dizziness, like a, a headache. See, there's, there's thirst, like, um, like I could really use something to wash down this burger kind of thirst. And then there's like what we might call a debilitating kind of thirst. And that's called dehydration. That's a different thing. Like this is not something that you want to mess around with. And most of us know that about over 50% of our bodies are made of water, which means that you can go days and days without food and survive. Like it's not very fun, but you can do it. But you won't last very long without water. And when you begin to get dehydrated, you get a headache, you get dizzy, your throat is dry. And that's just the physical side effects. The emotional side effects are there too. You get irritable, you get cranky, you maybe even get angry and depressed. Here's a couple of observations about physical dehydration. Did you know that you need to stay hydrated before you feel thirsty? Because if you wait until you feel thirsty, you might already be dehydrated. This is like uh, whenever you... Uh, those of you who got little kids, you took them to the beach this summer, you're slathering sunscreen all over them, and then you're like, take a drink, you got to drink some water. And they're like, I don't want to drink because I'm not thirsty. And you know, well, you got to drink before you feel thirsty. Otherwise, it might be too late. Do you know that uh, water is the best way to hydrate? And I don't know about you, I was thinking about this this last week. When I was growing up, I didn't really like the taste of water. Just tasted kind of bland. It wasn't very exciting. Like my drink of choice was Dr. Pepper, the nectar of the gods. 
just hooked me up to an IV of Dr. Pepper and I was just like, good to go. When I got into college and I was a poor college student and couldn't afford it anymore, I just went for the generic Dr. Zipper, but I didn't care. Right, I was just gonna drink that too. But here, here's the thing, the irony is that Dr. Pepper, like um, it tasted sweet and it seemed to satisfy in the moment, but you know as well as I do, it was just further dehydrating me. And here's kind of the interesting thing is that all these years later, like I, I can't even remember the last time I had a Dr. Pepper and I've actually developed a taste for water. Like I'd actually prefer water. I like have this like thing with me. I just kind of carry it around all day long. I'm just drinking water. I, I prefer the taste of it more. And actually, if I were to have a soda, it'd probably be like way too sweet because my tastes have changed. Now, the same thing that is true in physical dehydration is true in spiritual and emotional dehydration. See, all of us right now are really struggling with spiritual and emotional dehydration. Just the condition of the world, the condition of our relationships, all of us are struggling. What do I mean by that? Well, um, we're irritable, we're divisive, we're angry, we're depressed. But you, you gotta stay hydrated before you feel thirsty, meaning you can't wait until your life is in a crisis before you try to come to Jesus. You need to be coming to Jesus on a regular basis before you feel thirsty. And oftentimes that's counterintuitive to us. Um, did you know that um, throughout the scriptures, and we'll get to this in a minute, that Jesus refers to himself as a fountain of living water. But for so many of us, um, we don't really have a taste for it. Kind of tastes bland. There's so many other exciting things out there that we could go after to satisfy our thirst. A career, financial pursuits, maybe some sort of sexual appetite. Like those things seem really more exciting to us and they're sweet to the taste and taste really good at first, but... It just further dehydrates us all the more. We're going to have to, to wean our taste. We're going to have to develop a taste for this living water. And right now in this condition that, of the world that we are living in, we are just reminded of how broken and messed up and fallen the world really is. And it just continues to be. And we're just reminded of it all the time whether it's the ongoing pandemic, whether it's what's going on in Afghanistan, whether it's earthquakes in Haiti or hurricanes in New Orleans, or even just the own junk in our lives. We are fallen and broken people. We are thirsty. And as a result, we are angry and irritated and pointing fingers of blame. We, we want to blame somebody. And we are turning to the equivalent of sugary drinks. There's a word for that. It's called coping. And we are trying to cope with our brokenness, listen to me, in ways that only perpetuate the brokenness. Now, the world is only acting like the world is supposed to act. What, what really is detrimental in, is when Christ followers begin to suffer from spiritual and emotional dehydration. And instead of running to the source of living water, we settle for sugary drinks. And we run after all these things where we find our identity in it. And we really act no different than the world. I don't know how many people I've talked to that have told me maybe about a family member or a friend or a coworker that, man, I've been inviting them to come or I've been uh, reaching out to them, but they don't want to because they've really been turned off by Christians over the last year and a half. Now, I'm not trying to blame it all on that, but I am saying that when Christ followers are no longer drinking from the fountain of living water, then, then the world, rest of the world looks at that and go, there's nothing there. Why would I run after that? I'm reminded of something that God said to the prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament. He said, for my people. Now, he, he's talking about Christ followers. He's like, my people, they've done two evil things. They've abandoned me, the fountain of living water. And instead, they've dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. It's basically saying, instead of continuing to come to the fountain of living water, we've, we've dug a well in the ground and this is where we're kind of putting our own stuff to cope with all of our junk, all of our problems and it's, it, it, it's, it's running dry. And due to our sin nature, we all have this sin nature, oftentimes we maybe begin to wonder if this living water really can do for us what we thought it would do and so we turn to other things. And as a result right now, um, working relationships are suffering. Have you noticed? I went to three restaurants this last week. They were all closed because they can't hire enough help. Friendships are divided, um, families are strained, marriages are collapsing because 
really what the pandemic and all this strife has done is just, just brought to the surface the stuff that was already there. We just masked it with so many other things, but now we got to face it. Churches are struggling. School board meetings are out of control. We are filled with fear and depleted of faith. We are quick to criticize and really slow to extend grace. In other words, the craziness out there is unsettling us in here. We're thirsty. We're dying of thirst. And Jesus is sitting here saying, I've got a fountain of living water. If you'll just come and drink, the invitation is there. I was reading a book um, this past summer. It's a book by uh, Gordon McDonald. The title is Ordering Your Private World. It's, in, it's a great book. I highly recommend it. Uh, as I was reading it, though, um, he has this like sentence, and it really wasn't even what the chapter was about, but the sentence jumped off the page at me. And he said this, he goes, the problem uh, right now in our world is that so many churches are dry fountains. Living water used to flow, but now it doesn't. And then it just hit me right between the eyes. And if a church is a dry fountain, that means that its people have dried up a long time ago. And one of the things that I want us to do as, as a church, now listen, the, the, the right now, things are crazy in the world and there's all kinds of problems and all kinds of divisions. You can either cope or you can hope. You can cope with the brokenness. You can, you can continue to stay in this form of dehydration or we as a people can come and drink deeply of the fountain of living water. Well, like, what does that mean? Well, uh, John illustrates it for this in our passage today. John chapter four, I wanna walk through this. And, and in this passage, we meet a woman who is struggling with spiritual and emotional dehydration. She's thirsty, but she's been running around trying to quench this thirst in ways that only perpetuate the thirst. Now, this is a really, really familiar passage, but I want to encourage you not to, to tune out, even though it's familiar. It always baffles me whenever I run into Christ followers, like, oh, I've heard that passage before, and then you tune out. What are you talking about? Like, like the Spirit of God wants to bring fresh application through, there's a reason why it's a familiar passage. And the Spirit of God wants to bring fresh application. That's why the Bible says that it is a, a two-edged sword able to penetrate. It's not just in knowing the details of the story. It's allowing the Spirit of God to breathe application into your life from that story. And as we look at this together, I just want you to, to be open to what it is that God might say to you through this passage. Now, a little bit of context here. Jesus has just begun his public ministry. The religious leaders are comparing his ministry to his cousin, John the Baptist. In other words, they're being really, really divisive. And Jesus, what you'll find is he has no time for divisiveness. So he bails. And look at what it says in verse three. It says, so he left Judea and returned to Galilee. Really interesting sentence here. He had to go through Samaria on the way. That's an interesting way for John to put it because he didn't really have to. Could have gone another way. Now, in order to illustrate this, let me kind of show you this map of the Holy Land during the time of Jesus. There's a lot of detail on here. Really, I just want you to focus on this. Galilee, Samaria, and Judea. And John says, Jesus is here. He's got to get to here. And so he had to go through here. Now, obviously, you know that if you were uh, Google mapping this, it would probably say the shortest route is from here to straight through to here. And it was. But he didn't have to go. In fact, he, he could have gone around. And what you need to know is that during this time period, most Jews, which Jesus was a Jew, would have gone around Samaria. He wouldn't have gone through Samaria. Because, and here's why. Because they hated each other. They were uh, divided people. They had very different perspectives on life, social issues, and politics. I know it's hard to imagine but it was true, all right? There was just this like tribalism. In fact, uh, the, the division between the Jews and the Gentiles, between people who lived in Judea and Galilee and Samaria was so thick that Samaritans didn't want you traveling through there either. Like it didn't hurt their feelings. In fact, if a Samaritan found out that a Jew was traveling through Samaria, they would do everything they could to give you a hard time. Hotels would jack up the rates. The police would pull you over for having a taillight on your camel. You pop into a restaurant and the cook, if he found out that a Jew was there, he'd spit in your goat burger, right? They just did whatever they could do to kind of give you a hard time to say, you are not welcome here. What I want you to see is that John says, Jesus had to go through Samaria, but he didn't really have to. He wanted to because he knew that there was a woman 
who was on the other side of the track, so to speak. They were divided in every kind of way. And Jesus knew she was struggling with spiritual and emotional thirst. So he arrives at the village of Sychar, which is like right in the middle of Samaria. And it says in verse six, Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. That's important to remember. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. Now there's a whole lot going on here than what you might catch as you just read this at a glance. This isn't just any well. This is Jacob's well, one of the great patriarchs of the Jewish religion. Now, for some of you, this will be review. Others of you, uh, let me just kind of catch you up to speed, is that back in the book of Genesis, there was this guy named Jacob who bought this very land that Jesus is on here, and he digs this well that Jesus stops at to water his family and his livestock. Jacob has a son. His name is Joseph. Maybe that name sounds familiar to you. Joseph was taken into captivity. He was exiled into Egypt where he lived out the rest of his life. And this triggered the captivity and the bondage of the Jewish people that would last for the next 400 years. In other words, all of that stuff set into motion the division and the hate between the Jews and the Samaritans. John wants us to know this is Jacob's well. This is ground zero for the division that the Jews and the Samaritans would have had with one another. So I don't think it's any mistake that Jesus chose this well to sit down and to have a conversation with a perceived enemy who needs what only he can offer. John says that Jesus got there around noon and it was sort of the middle of the day and that's when this Samaritan woman comes to gather water. It's kind of unusual like in the, in the first century world, clearly they didn't have running water. Um, you had to go to the well to get water. And you would go before the sun came up, really for two practical reasons. The first one is that the uh, Middle Eastern sun is hot. And so uh, you would go before the sun came up. The second reason is you needed water for your daily activities, cooking and doing laundry and all that. And so you would go early in the day to get water. But John says that she showed up when the day is half over. I think there's only two reasons why. I I think one is she either overslept, which I highly doubt. The other reason, this is more likely, she was trying to avoid people. She She was hiding. She was concealing her authentic self, which is one key indicator of spiritual dehydration. See, uh, the well was kind of like the sort of the place of the local coffee shop nowadays, or maybe your Facebook news feed. It was kind of the place where you went to kind of see, check in with everybody, kind of see how everybody's doing. She had no interest in that. Because as we'll find, as you read through the passage, she's, she's a woman with a sinful reputation. She'd actually been with five different men. So I would imagine she's probably got some enemies. Some people that didn't like her very much. And so she goes in the middle of the day, she's putting up walls because um, she don't want to talk to anybody. And Jesus is going to disturb her world. I would imagine that as she, uh, as the well comes into view and she sees this Jewish man sitting there, she was probably really irritated. Because she's used to going to the well at noontime when nobody's there. Kind of mind her own business. And and all of a sudden she sees not just like another woman there, but not just another man there, but a Jewish man there. And I'm sure that she buttered under her breath. What is this guy doing here? And she, didn't, and she probably would have turned around and gone home, but they've already seen each other. It would have been awkward. How many of you uh, ever been to the grocery store? You go down the aisle and, and there's nobody on the aisle except for one person. And you're only looking for one item, but they happen to be standing in front of the very item that you want. <laughs> Am I the only one? Like how many of you are just like, you just kind of like kind of walk around them, like looking at other things. Like just, you, you don't, you're not interested in any other thing. You want the salsa. That's right. But the, they're standing in front of, right? And it's just kind of this awkward kind of vibe. I, would imagine, I, get, I just picked that up with, with Jesus and this woman. She kind of walks up. She's trying not to make eye contact. She's like, well, hopefully he won't even bother me. I'll just kind of do my thing and leave. And Jesus disturbs her world by asking her this question that would have sent her heart racing. He said, could you give me a drink? Seems innocent enough. But that was a loaded question. In fact, in the original Greek, um, it's a little more personal in nature. In the original Greek, Jesus says, can I drink from your bucket? Like that's weird today. (laughs) 
Like, you know, if you're at Chick-fil-A and somebody's like, can I have a sip out of your sweet tea? Right. Can I drink from your straw? Like, you'd be like, back up, creepo. <laughs> but see, this was, even, this was even bigger than that because a Jew traveling through Samaria would pack their own dishes. They would not take the risk of eating or drinking off the utensils that a Samaritan had formerly eaten off of, even if they had washed it in soap. Because to do that, like to ever eat off of a plate or drink off of a cup that a Samaritan had drunk out of would make you ceremonially unclean. And Jesus didn't care about any of that. He's like, cut, cut a drink from your bucket. And this woman, look at this in verse nine. This woman was surprised. That's putting it mildly. For Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. So she said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Now that is not a curious question. That is a, you better get out of my face. You're about to be pepper sprayed kind of a question. I, I envision her saying this with a New Jersey accent. <laughs> She's like, you better back off. Why are you talking to me? We don't have anything in common, gender wise, politically, socially, like we have nothing in common. We are enemies. You shouldn't even be here right now. And I love Jesus' response to this. It is filled with so much compassion. John says Jesus replied, and that may seem like a little word, but it's huge. He didn't react. He replied. He didn't meet her in the heat of that divisive thing or maybe that accusation, accusational question. He just replied, well, if you only knew the gift God has for you. It's interesting that he would phrase it that way. He didn't say if you only knew the solution, if you only knew the thing you've been looking. You know, he said it's a gift. If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you're speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Now notice Jesus didn't say well water. He said, living water. And throughout God's word, specifically in the Psalms and the Proverbs, but then we see it again in Revelation, is that oftentimes the metaphor that Jesus uses to describe who he is and what he's offering is living water. Kind of reminds me of what he would say later on in Gospel of John, John chapter 15. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. All you got to do is stay connected to me, abide. And so often we make this harder than it needs to be. We think that it's a transaction between us and God. Jesus says, no, it's actually more like you just coming and staying connected to the fountain of living water. Now she does what many of us do when things get really, really uncomfortable. She avoids, she redirects, she changes the subject. She, oh, she heard Jesus say living water, but she's gonna respond as if he said well water. She says, but sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? <laughs> and then she goes on, verse 12. And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? You know what that tells me? She was a church kid. She grew up in church. And I don't know her story and I don't know what happened. I don't know the hurt and the pain that's involved, but she went to Sunday school because she knew her Old Testament history. And she's actually picking a fight with Jesus which is what thirsty people do. And she's actually scraping the bottom of the bucket. And she's like, who in the world do you think you are? And I love this. Unfazed, check this out, verse 13. Jesus replied, didn't react. He replied, well, anyone who drinks this water, he's talking about the well, will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. You know what Jesus is saying? He says, I don't want you just to have a drink. I want you to come and I want you to have your thirst satisfied. I want there to be a spring of living water coming up within you. And all that means is that we stay connected to the source. And this was enough for, now there was a, the conversation goes on for the sake of time. I don't have time to unpack it all. You can read it for yourself uh, later this afternoon. Jesus is going to drive down on just the truth that's in her life. But I want you to, I want to skip ahead to verse 28 here. It says at this moment, after they had this conversation, it says that the woman left her water jar beside the well. That's a peculiar thing to do because she went there to get water. But she left the water jar there and she ran back to the village telling everyone 
Such a peculiar statement. Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did, exclamation point. Like that's a good thing. Can I tell you that if there was someone who knew everything that I've ever done, then the last thing that I would say to you is go talk to him. Like that's not good news at all. Like if you were like, hey, Aaron, we're getting ready to talk to somebody who knows everything you've ever done. Like I would panic because I know everything I've ever done and I wouldn't want you to know. But she says, this is good news. There's something about being fully known and fully loved and fully accepted by Jesus. That's really, really good news. She's, she's beginning to get it. And it says in verse 39 that she goes back to her own town. She runs around. She's like, hey, man, come see a man who told me everything that I ever did. And it said that many Samaritans from that town came to believe. Why? Because she convinced them? No, but because of her experience. They could see she was different. They could see something had dramatically changed within her. They could see that fountain of living water within her. The question is, is that normative for us today? I don't know that I always like the answer to that question. So here's what Jesus did. Jesus drew the thirst out of her. He helps her to see it. That's what he always does. You got to acknowledge you're really thirsty. And then he quenches that thirst. He satisfies the deepest longing within us. And then he gives, gives us access to this living water. So here's ultimately the truth that Jesus gave this woman that day. And this is available for every single person listening to this today. In Christ, you are deeply known. He knows everything about you. And you are deeply loved. There isn't anything, any sin that you've committed, any mistake that you've committed that, that throws him off. Because you're completely accepted. And we don't hear this anywhere. See, we have this longing within us to be deeply known. But we're scared that if we took off the mask and kind of laid out all of our stuff, we'd be rejected and judged and shamed. And oftentimes we are. Very rarely are you deeply known by somebody and deeply loved, let alone completely accepted. And Jesus says, what I've done for you is I've given you access to this water so you don't need to pretend anymore. You don't need to fight anymore. You don't need to argue anymore. And so many of our problems that we have right now um, are addictions that originate from trying to satisfy our souls in illegitimate ways. We're coping. And we're coping in ways that just perpetuate the brokenness that is there. See, one way to understand sin, we're gonna talk about sin uh, this fall in this series that we're gonna be in, but sin is really what it is, is thirsty people trying to satisfy that thirst in a way that never really satisfies. You ever notice you just keep getting thirsty again? Whatever, whatever addiction you have, whether it's caffeine or something stronger, you just got to keep going back to it again. Like it just, it just increases the thirst. And that's why God speaks so strongly against sin because it goes basically you're settling for a substitute. It's never going to satisfy you. And the invitation is there for, him to come, for us to come and to drink deeply. And when we do, that's transformational. What I want you to notice about the conversation with Jesus and the woman at the well is all the things that aren't in the conversation that we typically put in the conversation today. Now, I got to be really careful as I spell this out because I don't want you to think that I'm saying that any of this is unimportant, but just notice there's no transactional language in the conversation before she experiences change. Jesus wasn't like, hey, I need you to confess your sin. And do you believe that I'm the son of God? And repeat after me, I am the Christ, I am the Christ, the son of the living God, the son of the living God. No, I'm going to be baptized. I mean, and I'm not diminishing any of that stuff. I'm just saying that as we do that, we end up unintentionally turning our connection to God into a transaction. It's never meant to be that way. It's meant to be a relationship. And Jesus offers her living water and she becomes a missionary. She's completely and utterly changed. He didn't just offer her a drink. He offered her access to the source. I love how Tim Keller put it several years ago. He said this, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Now you water any of those things down or you put the emphasis too much on one over the other. You don't have the gospel anymore. You have a transaction. 
And we've all got to recognize how sinful we really are. But see, we're, we are, that, that is actually a safe place to be, to come and to be fully authentic and to go, yep, I'm broken. I'm flawed. I'm sinful. And yet I'm deeply known and deeply loved by Jesus Christ. You want to know the real irony of all this thirst talk? Is that when Jesus went to a cross, he said only a handful of things that we have recorded. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Jesus had a conversation with a, a thief on a cross. It actually is very, very similar to this one that he had with this woman here. Jesus also said this, I'm thirsty. That means that Jesus was willing to be thirsty so that you and our, I could have our thirst quenched. Not just for all of eternity, but in the here and now. So here's three questions I just want you to ask of yourself. Here's the first question. Are you thirsty? And I want you to spend some time thinking about that. Are you thirsty? Here's the second question. How does that thirst commonly present itself in your life? Meaning, what are the effects of your spiritual dehydration? If you are angry, if you are fearful, if you are irritated, if you are divisive, if you say things online you would never say to somebody's face, that's how your thirst is presenting itself. If you're addicted, that's how thirst is presenting itself. So you gotta just be honest about that. Now here's the third question. Are you drinking from a well, a cracked cistern, or the fountain of living water? Now clearly this is an invitation to those who have not yet given their life to Christ to give their life to Christ, but this is also an invitation for those who have given their life to Christ to come back to the fountain of living water because you might be drinking from a cracked cistern. And right now we are living in a world that is hurting and broken and divisive. We do not need Christ followers who are perpetuating the hurt and the brokenness with more of it because we're drinking from the wrong well. So um, this summer I was with a group of people in Wyoming and we went on a hiking trip and it was like a 12 mile hike. So, um, we hiked six miles uh, out kind of in the middle of nowhere. And it was a trail that the uh, Forest Service doesn't often get to. So there were trees down in the trail. It, uh, a lot of brush had grown up, places where it had flooded. A couple of times, like it just seemed like the trail ended. And uh, I didn't know if we were gonna keep going or not, but the guy that was kind of, kind of leading out in front, we, he'd figure out a way. You know, he'd kind of venture down. He's like, hey, I think I found a way through here. And we'd climb over stuff and We'd go through some water or stream just to get her and get back on trail and keep going. But it took a long time because there was obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. The ground beneath our feet was uneven. We got back six, seven miles out. We stopped, we had lunch by the river and then it was time to head back. And honestly, I was not looking forward to the hike back because of all the obstacles. I was like, man, we gotta go through all that again. But here's what was surprising to me is that going back, like we made incredibly good time. Like we got back like twice as fast as what it took to do the six miles in. And I was sitting there thinking like, why is that? Because we were still uh, coming up on the same obstacles we had to navigate. And, and it was as if the spirit of God uh, said to me that day, he's like, yeah, Aaron, the obstacles are still there, but I've increased your capacity to navigate the obstacles. This isn't brand new to you anymore. And I don't know about you, but as I look at the conditions of our world and I look at all the challenges that exist uh, at a global level, uh, a local, regional level, and even in my own personal life, here, here's what I oftentimes fall into. I often fall into this prayer. God, would you please remove the obstacle in my path? God, would you please solve this issue? God, would you please bring healing over here? God, would you help me to not feel this way anymore? And sometimes God will do that. But do you know what he does most of the time? He increases your capacity to navigate the obstacle. I keep asking God to make the ground underneath my feet solid. He says, how about I give your feet uh, solid footing for the uneven ground? That's a different thing. 
And right now, I, I don't know, like I wish I could tell you like, hey man, like, things, things are gonna get better. And they might get better in the short term, but in the long term, like just look at history. This world is broken, always has been, always will be until Jesus returns to make it right. So the prayer we need to start praying is, God, would you, would you help us to navigate these obstacles in a way that represents you well to a watching world? Revelation gives us this promise. I wanna end with this. It says this, for the, for the lamb, that's capitalized because that's referring to Jesus. On the throne will be their shepherds, capitalized because that's Jesus. He will lead them where? To springs of life giving water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That means in this world, we shed tears. Why? Because this is a broken world. It is painful. And yet we have a lamb who died on a cross for us to give us new life. He is our shepherd leading us through where to springs of living water. Question is, where are you drinking? Where are you going to sustain yourself for the trail ahead? And so uh, I'm super excited about this series that we're getting ready to jump into Next weekend, our fall teaching series, we're gonna go through uh, the New Testament book of Romans together as a church. And uh, the reason why I was uh, doing some study this summer and I was just like, what should we study this fall? And God brought me back to Romans. And those of you that have been in our church for a while know that um, I grew up in church, but I didn't, I didn't necessarily grow up in Christ. There's a difference. And I was well on my way to either walking away from church or being a really good self-righteous Pharisee. Those are usually the two options. And as an 18 year old, I read the book of Romans, not because somebody told me to, not because it was in Sunday school, but I just read it on my own. And it was when I got to chapter eight that the Holy Spirit hit me like a lightning bolt. And that's when, that's when I gave my life to Christ. Do you know that um, almost every spiritual reawakening in history came um, after a study of Romans that I know of. Romans is like the Mount Everest of the New Testament. It is Paul at his absolute best. And Romans was written because the church in Rome had just gone through a massive cultural crisis that led to division within the church. Sound familiar? And Paul writes this letter to say, hey, listen, you all have different perspectives and opinions on all kinds of things, culturally and politically and socially but here's what the gospel is and you're united in that. And if Paul hadn't have written Romans, we wouldn't be here today because it reunited the church so that way it could be a sending agency to Spain and around the world. It recalibrated the church in the midst of cultural crisis. So next weekend, we're starting a study together as a church in the book of Romans, we're calling it Recalibrate. And next weekend, every single person will get one of these journals when you walk in. And uh, this is a journal that our team designed over the summer, uh, not just to be used on Sunday for you to take notes, but also for you to be used every day during the daily Bible reading that comes into your email, as well as in your small group. So everybody's gonna get a copy of one of these journals. Uh, come next week, get one, uh, bring it back with you every week as we utilize this. Uh, I, I wanna say that these are not available today, all right? First service, people were like, they wanted to get it right now. This is the only copy in the building, all right? You can't have it, it's mine. Um, so you'll get it next week, all right? We want everybody to grab this as we study through the book of Romans. And I've taught sermons out of Romans, but I've never walked through it like this. So you can pray for me because uh, it's a daunting book, but I believe that God is gonna use it uh, to uh, hopefully do big, big things in the life of our church. I'm excited. I really am. I'm excited about where God's taking us, about where we're going. Because the last time we saw this type of cultural shakeup was 1968. There were racial riots, there was an unwanted war, and there was a pandemic. And out of 1968 came something called the Jesus Movement that actually revolutionized, kind of breathed fresh wind into the life of the church. It wasn't perfect in every way, no movement ever is, because it's man-made, or it's got men, men involved. But I believe that we're headed actually into a reshaping of the future of the church. I believe there's a day, I, I don't, I, I, I think there's so many uh, really painful things happen from the pandemic. I do believe there is a day that we'll look back and say, God, thank you for allowing us to walk through that because what it did was it revealed our thirst and all the things we were running to to quench that thirst that couldn't. And so uh, we get to be a part of this to see what Jesus is gonna do in this culture and in this world. 
Father, we come to you right now and uh, thank you that you are the fountain of living water. Forgive us when we keep running to cracked cisterns to try to satisfy a thirst that it never will. And so God, today as Christ followers, we know the world is watching us in person and online more than ever. And we don't wanna let man-made personal perspectives to be a dividing wall of hostility. We wanna represent you well. We don't wanna react, we wanna respond. And that requires us to stay close to the fountain of living water. So God, I pray that you would take this study in the book of Romans and that you would use it in big ways in the life of our church because we wanna be used by you to take back ground for the kingdom that the enemy has taken over the last year and a half. And so may it begin with each one of us as we come to you now. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody says... Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get lift up your soul. You've got light inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Just highlight what Aaron said today. You are deeply known. You are deeply loved. And you are deeply accepted by Jesus. And so today, if you feel God stirring something up in you and you're ready to admit that you're thirsty, you have access to living water. And so will you drink, drink, drink deeply? Will you invite Jesus into that space? And so if you are thinking about following Jesus and letting him in for the first time today, you don't need us to do that. You can do that on your own, just praying a simple prayer, like Jesus, meet me here. Jesus, step into my life. But we'd love to be able to come alongside you in that. So if that's where you're at, we'd love to encourage you. Text the word Jesus to 87221 and our team would love to be able to follow up with you. If you're ready to go on the journey with us as a Traders Point Online family through the Book of Romans in this Recalibrate series starting next week. If you're local in Indy, you can head to a physical campus next week to get that journal. If you're not local, uh, head to our website, tbcc.org slash journal and check the box. Let us know if you're interested in the group. We'd love to have you and connect face to face with you during this series in a short term Zoom group. So let us know there. And if you're looking for prayer today, we'd love to be able to pray for you. Head to tpcc.org slash prayer. Well, go out, have an incredible week. Go and make a difference. We'll see you right back here next week.